and shadows of the four beings. In an isolated house occupied by a gorgeous young woman, sat watching. Finally, the woman headed the man. It was midnight, and he was in the house. It was Enad who wanted to end the world. It was Enad who wanted the woman to be free. Enad prepared to enter the house when the Gemini took her from her roof for raising her to the heart. But then, the Gemini prepared to sexually assault and kill the terrified woman who saw her. The woman took the muscle of baby, staring up at him and smiling. This was the last time the Gemini could be jarred out of his murder suit. By the eyes. Welcome to SCP, the Serial Story. I'm your host, Caroline, the first biology professor. solicitation company. About a week after he started, some cops showed up at the at the uh, telephone solicitation company. They were looking for another employee, but Danny acted inappropriately nervous. He was demanding to know who they were looking for, so it struck people as a little bit strange. A few days before Christmas, Danny was terminated from this company for poor performance. But in January of 1990, Danny got a job with Truman Cooley, doing electrical work. This didn't last long, and eventually Danny was laid off from this job. In mid-April of 1990, Danny started dating a woman named Georgette Eaton. But according to Georgette, the relationship between her and Danny was very short and it was volatile. In fact, she said that Danny made her feel like she was dirty. Right after Danny and Georgette would have sex, Danny would get up and take a shower, and so that made Georgette feel like she he thought she was really dirty. Around this time, Danny had made some um, rich friends, a couple named Clawson. He met them at a local bar. He ended up doing some work for them, um, some, you know, menial work for them. And eventually, they invited him to attend a birthday party there on April 19th. True to form, Danny grabbed his guitar and he sang and played for all of the guests at the birthday party. One of the Clawson's friends approached them and warned them that there was something wrong with Danny. She went down to the creek to fetch a bit of water. She went down to the creek to fetch a bit of water. And the way she needs me. James to pull a gun on Danny. James 
fired the gun into the air. And with that, Danny left the house. James locked the door, but Danny had gone outside to retrieve a gun that he had stashed away behind a garage or a barn or something. Danny got back to the door and he kicked in the back door and he yelled, You want to shoot it out, old man? And then he shot his father in the head and the stomach. Danny left. James was taken to the hospital in critical condition. Danny went to his friend for Clausen's, but he didn't go there for their help. He went there to rob them so that way he could escape. They tried to calm him down, and it appeared that they had done so. Um, they even called Danny's mother to see if James was alive. Danny was apparently furious that his father had lived. Um, he, he started jumping up and yelling that James should be dead. The Clausens gave Danny about $30, a warm jacket, and some food, and with that, Danny took off. By June 2nd, Danny had made it to the city of Kansas, and he robbed a house. While he was in the house, he stumbled across some identification papers um, for a man named Michael Kennedy Jr., who was born in 1949 and was dead. So he stole this man's identification papers so that way he could guy's identity. By June 12, 1990, Danny had made his way to Kansas City, Kansas, and it was at 10 p.m. that same night that Danny robbed the Westwood United Superstore. He got away with about $1,600. And then on June 30th, Danny tried to rob the same store, but this time he didn't get as much money. He drove across the state line to Kansas City, Missouri, um, because Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri, they city that crosses between, it's like right on the border between um, between Kansas and, and Missouri. Sometimes you can see where it's the same city, sometimes it's the same city. Once he was in Kansas City, Missouri, he robbed a SunFresh grocery store and he made off of close to $9,000. Somewhere between Kansas City, Missouri and Boulder, Colorado, Danny met up with a man named Steve who was reportedly, according to him, a driver for some up-and-coming mobster type. And it was with Steve that Danny smoked cocaine for the first time, so to speak. Eventually, he made his way to Boulder, Colorado, and he was sleeping outside in a sleeping bag when he saw a pretty young blonde jog by. Danny had been asleep in his sleeping bag um, with no clothes on. So after the, the pretty young jogger had disappeared over the foothills, he stood up, got out of his bed, and he said it was then that Gemini stood up naked on the hill with his knife, slashing into the air with his knife and laughing. Gemini reached down and pulled up his pants. He gazed around and he looked for his victim. Gemini, Danny, was hiding down by some water so that he could ambush the girl when she ran by him again. As he stood up, he startled her, but she then recognized him from having seen him naked earlier and he smiled at her and she smiled back. So then as she started to run on again, uh, Gemini, Danny, jumped out behind her and grabbed a knife and then grabbed her, grabbed his knife and then grabbed her by the arm. And he flung her down onto the ground and prepared to attack her with his knife in hand. Uh, well, this girl was not about to let Danny do anything to her that day. So she started to fight back and she punched him in the face and punched him everywhere she could. It actually got a, uh, a couple of really good hits in. But then, then Gemini lost it and beat her something terrible. And in Danny's book, uh, let me just read this paragraph to you. Quote, when Gemini tasted blood in his mouth, he went into a rage. Thud, 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 thud. Blow after blow rained down on the once beautiful face, staring in, cat, in shock at him. End quote. He told her she was going to die. He turned her over onto her stomach and she and bound her hands behind her back with gray tape. And she started to cry and ask why you're you know, why are you doing this? You're a good looking guy. You don't have to do this. She was bleeding to him from from her bloody, messed up face. She made one last effort to gain her freedom and screamed no. For some reason that snapped Danny back to himself and he felt 
he turned her back over onto her, where he untaped her, turned her back over, and apologized to her and said he didn't mean to hurt her. This girl knew that it was Danny Rawlings that had assaulted her that day. She must feel pretty lucky for having been one of the few people to escape his, she was able to escape Gemini. From here, Danny made his way back towards Florida. He stopped in Gainesville on July 9th to call his mother. But then after that, from like July 17th to the 22nd, he stayed in Tallahassee, which, so if you know anything about the, <laughs> the way Florida set up, there's the panhandle where Tallahassee and Baltimore Beach, Pensacola, all those things are. And then there's the, the lower part where you know, Miami is, and then in the center of Florida is Orlando. So Gainesville is about four hours from, four or five hours from Miami, and it's probably two or three hours to from Tallahassee. While Danny was in Tallahassee, he stayed at a motel under the name of the stolen identity of Michael Kennedy. On July 18th, Danny bought another K-Bar night. And then July 22nd, he headed down to Sarasota. Once he was in Sarasota, he had quite the time, it seems like. On July 25th, he went and got a new glasses prescription under the name of Michael Kennedy. He bought a gold chain and a violet amethyst ring. On July 26, 1990, Danny went to the Brown Derby Lounge and he asked the bartender out, but she declined. Uh, she declined his advances. At one point, it must have been that same day, he went to Burdines. And Burdines is like a, it, it's a department store. I don't know, I don't think they still have them in Florida. At least they don't on the West Coast where I am now. But they they were, uh, there was lots of them on the East Coast and up in Tallahassee and all throughout. But it's just like a department store, like a Dillard's level department store. But he bought some expensive clothes there. It seems as though he made friends with the salesman at Burdines. So he hung out that day after he bought a bunch of stuff from, from the salesman at Burdines. He hung out and waited for the salesman, whose last name was Ford, to get off work. And then Danny invited him to dinner and told this guy that Danny had made like $10,000 by selling a song. And a couple days later, Danny showed back up to Burdines. And Danny, Ford, and then Ford's roommate all went out clubbing together. Danny and Ford seemed to have hung out quite a bit while they were in while Danny was in Sarasota. Danny eventually went back to that Brown Derby, asked out the bartender again. Um, her name was Tara Derby, but she was very cousins. But this time she agreed to go to dinner with him. They went out a couple of times after that, but she, you know, she would later say that she she saw a dark side of him frequently. While he was in Sarasota, he also went out with a woman, a woman named um, Layla Grossman a few times. Layla was interviewed about a year after she had met Danny, and she talked to the about her physical relationship with Danny. She would like she would describe it as her having to be the aggressor, that Danny um, never pushed himself on her if she declined a particular sex act, that he didn't force her to do it, that he seemed almost timid. And although they'd been intimate a few times, but they hadn't had penetrative sex. I don't know if that's because Danny wasn't able to perform or what the story is, but that seems to be the case with a lot of these serial killers is that they can't perform um, they can't perform under normal sexual circumstances. They have to do really horrible, violent, vile things in order to um, become excited. Danny's experiences with all of these people in Sarasota had left him resentful. He felt like as if these friends were only interested in him for his expensive spending habits, which is funny because he's the one that was offering to take people to dinner, buying people things, and bragging about money, and then he was resentful that people only seemed to be interested in money that he was spending. In his book, Danny would claim that he had lots of wild and crazy sex with lots of lots of people when he was in Sarasota living as Michael Kennedy. You know, that's kind of hard to believe because, you know, most of these serial killers dive into their sexual history, there's always, always some sort of sexual dysfunction when it comes to the normal, uh, 
normal consensual sex. On August 4th, 1700 dollars from from that robbery. That night after the murder, he had gone back to the hotel he was staying at, changed into black clothing, and got his knife, and went out on the hunt for victims to a vicious rage. He wandered into a neighborhood, then he was drawn to a house that was really well lit. As he got closer to it, he saw that it was occupied by a pretty young brunette. He saw her watching TV in their living room. He waited for a while, watching her, waiting for the perfect time to get into the house. After she got done watching a TV show, she got up um, and turned the TV off and went out for a couple of hours. Once she went out, Danny broke into her house and waited for her to return. When she came back to the house, she had no idea Danny was there. Her sister just sat and waited and watched. Um, she messed around in the kitchen for a little bit and then went to the bathroom. She went to the bathroom, she left the door open, watched her as she um, as she urinated. When she stepped out of the bathroom, he jumped out at her and grabbed her, pulled her hands behind it, her, her back and taped her wrist and was going to put thumb cuffs on her, but she asked him not to. As the rape went on, eventually the girl switched tactics with him. At first she was telling him not to kill her, but she was scared and had to make him hurry up. But then she switched tactics and pretend like she was enjoying herself. She told him that she would not call the police. And for some reason, Danny didn't kill her. He was more, as he said, more Enad that night than Gemini. So he didn't kill her. She put on a robe and they went to the kitchen. She asked him if he wanted a beer. Yeah, that would be great. And of course, she told Danny, we're going to kill her. She asked Danny, well, why are you doing this? You're so good looking. Um, you know, Danny was just trying to make her talk. He gave her the little thumb cuffs he was going to use on her as a gift before he left and promised her he would never do it. Danny made it to 
It is known by August 18, 1989. And under the name Michael Kennedy, he projected to the university. He would stay there from August 18 to August 23, 1989. On August 23, 1989, Kim decided he needed to one for each year he spent in prison. He'd already killed three, Louis Grissom, Tom Grissom, and uh, Louis Kent and Sean in 1989 for treason. So he only had five more victims to go. Danny recorded this right before he went out to begin his murder campaign. Can you hear myself? I can hear myself. Wow. Well, uh, I'm in a different place than the last time I recorded. Now I got the sky for for a blanket, the earth for a bed, and some rumpled up clothes for a pillow. But it's okay. It's just the way it is. You take the good with the bad. And you know, at the first of this, this recording that I did, um, was, I, you know, I, I, I don't know, I, I just, my heart was real heavy and I was toting a cold and trying to get over that. And so, you know, the guitar playing wasn't all that good, and my timing was off, so, because I, I wasn't feeling good, but, at any rate, I just wanted y'all to have something to remember me by. I'm, listen to those crickets. Man. Well, I don't know, you know. I just... Yeah. I'm making do, but... Kind of lost for words. I, I really am. I don't, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking about what to say. I really don't know what to say. I didn't know this much. I love you. I know we can't ever be together. But at least there's one consolation. At least I'm free. At least I'm healthy. Uh, I know I have to run the rest of my life. But I'm getting pretty good at it. If that means anything. I've been I've been stopped by the police I don't know how many times checking IDs and stuff oh. I guess I might do hope I do mom I love you listen I know you're a lot stronger than you know than, than you make out to be you'll get along okay without me uh, I, I wish that it wasn't so. I'd love to be there by your side. But, you know, it's just like the little lion cubs. They grow up one day and they go off on their own. Uh, well, it was, it's just the way it is. I don't want you feeling sorry for me. I don't want you worrying about me. I'm a big boy. I take care of myself. So I don't want you to worry about me, okay? I'll be all right. We're all down here for just a breath anyway. Devin? <laughs> You better get a dead gum deer for me with that, that bow I got you now. Yeah, just go a couple of times and see if you don't get lucky with it. Take it out in the backyard and practice with it when you ain't got nothing else to do for deer season. Comes up this October. And give it a shot. 
just make sure that you put on some, you know, camouflage, good camouflage, because, you know, when you're going bow hunting, you got to have camouflage. And I'll tell you something else, too. Aim for the lungs, straight through the rib cage. Either there or the heart, but the best thing to do is hit the lungs. It's the best shot for, for a deer. It's straight through the lungs. He don't go very far. Don't chase after him when you hit him, when you stick him. When, when that arrow hits him, what you got to do is you got to just watch which way it goes. And when he goes out, when he's out of sight, listen. You'll hear him banging into trees and stuff. And then finally, you'll hear him either either fall down or you'll hear him stop running. He'll stay right there until he bleeds to death if you don't go and chase him. So what you need to do is after you stick him is just sit right down there for about 30 minutes to, to an hour. It just depends on how you feel about it. That is, if you're going to ever do any deer hunting, I never could get you interested in it when uh, when you and I was able to go. You just, I don't know, you know, it just didn't interest you. Well, brother, I'm hanging in there. Yeah, I'm hanging in there. I'll say that much for myself for the moment. Plan on going the distance. I'll give it my best shot. Well, Dad, I hope you're doing better. You know, it's probably don't want to even hear from me. Uh, you know, Pop, I don't think you was ever really concerned about the way I felt anyway. No, I really don't. You never would take time to listen to me. Sign off for a little bit. That's something I gotta do. sensitive to descriptions of crime scenes, etc., then I would stop listening now and scroll all the way, or scroll, fast forward all the way towards the end, because the next um, big chunk of this episode is going to be talking about what happened at Casey's house. 
so the maintenance man called the police, and the police came out to Lynn's apartment. The police officer that showed up, his name was Officer Barber, he ended up breaking down a door to the apartment. He found Sonia Larson's body on an upstairs bed and Christina Powell's body on the living room floor downstairs. The entry point was the dining room. Um, the dining room had a door that was warped, and it didn't lock or uh, close or open properly. So the crime scene that this officer walked into was pretty horrific. Um, I want to read to you some passages from the uh, for Danny Rawlings' appeal, um, the initial brief that was filed for him. And this is just describing what officers found at Christina and Sonia's apartment. So upstairs, an unmanaged bra was found uh, placed neatly across some books on the top of some shelves in the room where Larson's body was found. A bag of clothing containing a gray t-shirt with a few cut blood on it was found above Larson's left knee. Her panties were against the closet door. Larson's shirt, which was pulled up around her neck, had multiple sharp tears that were consistent with the wounds on her body. A major portion of the blood on the bed was two to three feet above Larson's head. There were indications in the blood that something had been dragged through it after the injuries were sustained. Downstairs, a pair of shorts were found in the hallway. Between the kitchen and dining room, a bra and a bra strap were found near Powell's feet, along with the contents of a purse. A yellow shirt was found at Powell's head. Blood on the shorts was consistent with Powell's blood type. Blood on the shirt was consistent with Larson's blood type. A two-inch void of blood or anything else on Powell's wrist indicated that she was bound during the attack. Um, so she was probably bound when she got taken and then was moved to the back room. The medical examiner um, stated that Sonia Larson died of multiple stab wounds. In her right arm, there were four thrusts that went completely through the arm and three punctures were made. There were five stab wounds. Uh, these were closely grouped through the right thrust, which penetrated the lungs and the heart. There was a four-inch wound beneath the left breast, and beneath that, a smaller stab wound of about an inch in length. Approximately two quarts of blood had accumulated in the left pleural space, which is um, just a quick explanation here. So your lungs, they have a like a sac that surrounds them, and that sac has fluid in it, and that's that's the pleural space in between the actual lung and like your or the, um, the inside of your your chest plate is the same thing. So. Uh, all that blood, two quarts of blood in that space is a lot. And that if she wasn't dead from something else, then that would have, um, that could have very likely killed her. On the front surface of her left thigh was a slash measuring about five by two and a half inches. Um, the medical examiner thought that the wounds were made with a fairly large knife, at least one inch thick. At the autopsy, Hamilton suggested, and so he was the medical examiner, he suggested that the candidate um, would be a Marine K bar knife. In the medical examiner's opinion, the whole group of injuries could have occurred in a very short blitz style attack in less than half a minute. Larson probably lost consciousness very rapidly within a minute of being left alone. Um, although Larson's t shirt was pulled upward, exposing her chest, the shirt had slits or tears corresponding to the injuries on her body indicating that the shirt was on the body in a normal fashion when she was stabbed. So I, what they're, I think what they're getting at here is that she was not sexually assaulted. Um, it appeared that she'd been pulled down to the edge of the bed after the attack and draped over the edge of the bed frame. Christina Powell had a cluster of five stab wounds to the mid-back with perforation of the right lung, ligature marks on both wrists, small bruises on her right and left leg, and a superficial cut on the right wrist. The wounds appeared to be made by the same weapon used on Larson. Two wounds had short wound tracks. Two entered the lung, one of which was seven and a half inches in length. Another wound track entered the right pleural space, but did not puncture the lung, probably because the lung had already collapsed. Associated with this wound was an accumulation of blood in the right pleural space. Al did not die as quickly as Larson and may have been conscious for a few minutes, perhaps a little bit less. A towel and a bottle of dish detergent were between Powell's legs, and a sticky fluid um, was found in the whole pubic region. Okay, so here's what they think happened. Um, the girls had been at Walmart shopping, and Danny had seen them there and followed them home. Once Danny broke into the girls' apartment, he, and this is according to Danny out of Danny's book, um, The Making of a Serial Killer, 
He said that he could not decide which girl he wanted to attack first. He decided to kill Sonia so that he could take his time raping Christina. He stabbed, um, he says he stabbed Sonia in the chest as he covered her, his, her mouth with duct tape. He said she fought back for maybe 30 to 45 seconds. And he stood over her and he watched and waited for her to die. God, that's awful. And then he said, if yourself the murder gave him so after he killed Sonia, he went downstairs and he overpowered Christina and taped her pants behind her back. He cut her t-shirt up the middle and then cut the bra off that she was wearing and ripped her panties off. He said he sexually assaulted her by playing with her naked body and she cried and begged him not to hurt her. He, um, he said he forced her to perform oral sex on him before he actually um, inserted himself. And when she cried out in pain, he told her, quote, take the pain, bitch. He then taped her mouth shut and proceeded to tell her that he was going to kill her and cut off her nipples. Leaving Christina in terror, Danny dumped the girl's purses out and looked around the apartment for other items to steal. So he hadn't killed Christina yet at this point, according to him. He let her sit there and suffer as he wandered around the house and looked for things to steal and then went to the kitchen, ate a banana and he returned to Christina, turned her onto her stomach, and then stabbed her in the upper back, flipped her back over, removed her breasts, placing them in a plastic bag to take. Um, then he remembered something that his father had said. So he got a bottle of disc detergent, and he cleaned Christina's pubic hair. So following that, then he went and cleaned himself up, and he took time to pose both women in an incredibly shocking manner. Christina, he left face up with a notebook under her head, her breasts removed and spread eagle. Sonia, he cut off her panties and then he dragged her to the end of the bed, posing her with her knees bent and her legs spread open. His next victim, Krista Coyne, who was a 15-year-old in March of Florida. Krista was to start um, school at Santa Fe Community College. And she got a job as an overnight clerk at the Alachua County Sheriff's Department. Her goal was to become a crime lab technician. On Friday, August 24th, Krista Point and her aunt Joy um, had gone to IHOP to visit Krista's mom. Um, it's Krista's mom worked there. And it was here that Danny saw her. So Danny obviously followed her back to her place. Um, and when he went back that night at about 8 o'clock, he stood out back and he watched and waited for her. But Krista had gone to a party that night. Her mother was spending the night. Krista was spared one more night. On Saturday, August 25th, Krista went to play racquetball with a friend. While she was gone, Danny broke into her apartment to look. Sometime around 10 p.m., Krista came home, and she was surprised by Danny when she went into the bathroom. So according to Danny, he beat her and he stabbed her. And as he killed her, he ejaculated. He then cut her from pubis to sternum. He cut off her nipples and he set them next to her body and then removed her breasts out on the bed. Um, as he was about to assault the dead girl by ejaculating into her mouth, he decided instead to decapitate her and place her head on a bookcase in the living room. Um, when Chris's answer machine picked up a call um, while Danny was still there. It spooked him and he took off. And this must have been about 4 o'clock in the morning because there was a woman who was awakened by the sound of somebody running past her apartment. Sonia and um, Christina's bodies were discovered on August 26th, somewhere around early afternoon. Tracy and Paul and to Boda were friends from high school and college. To share where Danny lived in, although they were just friends. Tracy was 21 and studying pre law. Danny was 22 and studying architecture. He also worked as a bartender at the Moose Hall. Tracy was a beauty queen, and Manny was a former football player, 200 pounds, six, six foot three inch football player. Tracy had been out of town, I think, visiting her boyfriend in Miami. 
she came back to Gainesville on the 26th of August at about 6.30. Um, she came back to her place at Gatorwood Apartments. On that same night, on August 26th, around 10.30, a couple of girls in the Gatorwood Apartment buildings would later report that they heard rattling on their apartment door. At around 12.30 on August 27th, Tracy called her sister, Tisha Jackson. And this is kind of interesting, just a strange coincidence, I guess really not that strange because it's not like it was like some huge town. But Tracy's sister, Tisha, worked at the Alutua County Sheriff's Office, and this is also where Krista worked. They talked for a few minutes, and then Tisha had to get back to work. And by this time, news of Sonia and Christina's murders um, had started to spread. But Tracy wasn't really worried too much about it because she lived with this big, tough football player guy. Krista Hoyt was supposed to be at work on August 27th at midnight. When she did not show up, Tisha called her supervisor to let her know that Krista had not come in. Krista was an incredibly reliable employee, so her coworkers were very, very worried when she didn't show up to work and when nobody could get her on the phone. So shortly after she had, um, you know, shortly after she had not arrived for work, a sheriff's deputy went to her place to check. He made entry into the apartment. He found Krista's head just as Rowling had hoped. Rowling had put her head on a bookshelf so that it was facing out to whoever walked into the room. That's the first thing that they would see. So around the time that Krista's body was being discovered, Manny was watching Tracy Pauls. Manny got home from work that night around 2 a.m. And at 3 a.m., Danny pried open the sliding glass door of the apartment. Danny didn't see Manny go into the apartment. When he when Danny made entry into, into the apartment, and as he went in, he was really surprised to find that there was a guy there. And Manny was asleep in his bed. So, so Danny decided that he would stab this guy while Manny was asleep. He stabbed Manny so hard, in fact, that the knife tore through one of the man's thoracic vertebrae. So the thoracic vertebrae are the ones that are in your, like, torso, like from, you know, from about where your collarbones are down to the end of your ribs. He stabbed right through this guy's thoracic vertebrae. This should have killed Manny, but instead of dying, Manny fought back, and he almost knocked Danny out. But unfortunately, Danny was able to win the fight by continuing to stab Manny. He ended up stabbing Manny 31 times before Manny. Tracy was hearing all of this commotion and she opened her door and saw Rowling. She screamed and ran back to her room and locked the door, but Rowling kicked the door open. When Tracy saw him, she looked at Danny and she said, you're the one, aren't you? And Danny replied, yeah, I'm the one. Tracy started screaming and her screaming was heard by a bunch of people in the apartment building, but people in the apartment complex just chalked it up to students party and too loud. So Danny taped Tracy's hands behind her back, and right before he taped her mouth shut, she told him he was going to be caught. She was wearing only a t-shirt, which Danny cut off of her. He told her what he was going to do to her, and he played with her much like he did the others. But then he turned her over and, um, brace yourself, he anally raped her, and then stabbed her over and over again in the back. Danny then dragged Tracy's body into the hallway between the bathroom and the living room, and he posed her spread eagle, her legs spread eagle, in a very lewd position. He then went to remove the tape from her, and he realized that she wasn't dead yet, so he got a washcloth to clean the blood from her face, and then he raped her again. He then got a towel from the bathroom, and he propped Tracy's hip ups on it, and then cleaned her genitals with detergent. He said he waited and watched as she died, and it took her a long time to die. He went through the apartment. He looked for stuff that he could steal, and eventually after Tracy died, Danny left, and he jumped into the complex's pool to clean himself off. On Monday morning, August 27th, Danny robbed the First Union National Bank at gunpoint. This is less than a mile from Krista Hoyt's. Um, The money that he stole contained dye packs, and so I guess what they do is they, um, they take They put dye packs and they place them in stacks of $10 or $20 bills. And then, and then when the uh, bank robber tries to open up the, the um, bundles of money, the dye breaks. 
um, in it and it stains all of the money. So then banks know that this is a, that the money was from a, a bank robbery. Something like 75% of banks in the U.S. use these kind of die packs to dissuade bank robbers. By August 28th, um, 7 a.m., Tracy's boyfriend, Chris, the one that she had just come back from seeing in Miami, was in a panic because he couldn't get a hold of her. He asked a friend of Manny's to go check on them, and Chris also called the apartment manager. So the apartment manager and Manny's friend went to the apartment, and they entered at Manny and Tracy's apartment, saw Tracy's body, and so they left immediately, and then they locked the door behind them, and they went to call the police. When they got back like five minutes later with the police, the front door was unlocked and a dark color, a dark colored bag that had been on the floor above Tracy's head was gone. Later, it would be theorized that Danny had left his bag there and barely escaped when, when Manny's friend and the apartment manager had come to check on them. And um, when they left to go call the police, Danny got back in or was still in the house and, uh, and grabbed his bag and left and you know didn't lock the door like they did. So by this point, panic had really set in in Gainesville. Like I said, I, I think in the first episode, I lived in Coral Springs, which is on the East Coast. I went to high school and stuff there. And I remember when this happened, and it was terrifying. My friends that had gone off to college all came home. It was really, um, it was really a scary time. The police were canvassing the area, and some of the neighbors in the apartment complex started to point the finger at a young man named Ed Humphreys. In the meantime, on August 28th, which was that Tuesday, police were patrolling the area near, near Krista Hoyt's um, apartment complex, and they saw two men lurking in the woods, you know, near where her, near where uh, Krista lived. The police stopped them, but Danny was able to get away. So Danny was one of them. Danny was able to get away um, because he was very athletic. The police eventually found his campsite and at the campsite, they found they found the cassette player and cassette tape, which is where all of the stuff that I've been playing in the, throughout the episodes, all the music and the spoken the spoken stuff from Danny Rawling is all from that tape, that cassette tape. That's why the quality is so bad because some of it was recorded outside by a campfire on a you know a late '80s uh, cassette player. Which, if you are <laughs> if you're much younger than I am. The other thing the police found at that campsite was the bag of money from the bank robbery that had that had been um, that the die had exploded on. So they knew that whoever had been at that campsite was connected to the bank robbery, but they hadn't put together yet that the murders and the bank robbery were connected. So as the days continued following the murders, um, there were a number of sort of odd things that occurred. On August 30th, 1990, University of Florida student Christopher Osborne returned home after playing tennis to find that his TV was on, the door was wide open, there were dishes in the sink, and evidence that somebody had watched a Playboy videotaped, played with his puppy, and stole his car. By August 31st, thousands of students had left UF, and more than 700 of them did not return. September 1st, 1990, Tampa. Larry Dale Lawrence and Holly Joe Paula returned home from a weekend camping trip to find that their home had been broken into. And here's what was stolen. A Nikon 35mm camera, $10 in change, an unused knife sharpening stone, black leather wallet with credit cards, and two birth certificates for Anthony James Lawrence. And while Danny was in Tampa, he robbed a save and pack. Um, he barely got away. On September 2nd, Danny broke into a house owned by a woman named Janet B.O.S. Boss. He called his mother and he called Bunny. He left an elastic in the bathroom with strands of his hair still attached. So like a, you know, like back before they had scrunchies and things, you would just use a rubber band or an elastic band like that in order to pull your hair back. He stole their 10 speed bike. And then he went and found a house that was under construction and he spent the night there. By September 4th, Danny meets Diana, an artist who invites him to spend the night at her place. I can I can't even imagine uh, the horror that woman must have felt when she found out later that he was the Gainesville River. On September 5th, Danny went to a strip club in Tampa, and according to him, according to him, 
he hooked up with two strippers who he then, um, they went back to a hotel together to party and smoke crack. Um, <laughs> the strippers robbed him, which was awesome. <laughs> September 6th, Danny went back to the club to get even with the strippers who robbed him. Um, but instead, he ended up breaking into the apartment of Reynaldo and Patricia Rio. While he was there, he ate a banana. He took a couple of watches and then he stole their 1983 Ford Mustang and he headed towards Ocala. September 7th, Danny robbed a Winn-Dixie grocery store in Ocala, um, but the cops responded really quickly and Danny ran. He first, he, he evaded them with the Mustang until he ended up hitting a couple of elderly women who were sitting at a stop sign in their car. He got out then and ran and he ran through an insurance office and into a flea market. And the flea market was just lousy with elderly um, Floridian ladies. So the cops finally caught up to him and he surrendered. Then he sat in jail. On September 25th, 1990, DNA test results indicated that the same man left his semen at two of the crime scenes. At that third crime scene, he may have just, Danny may have just done a good job of cleaning cleaning up any bodily fluids that he may have left behind. So at this point, Danny's wanted for bank robbery, although they don't know it was him yet. They don't know that the person that they're looking for is named Danny Rawling, nor do they know that he was the Gainesville Ripper. So he was on the run from the law. Tenants at the Gatorwood apartment complex were pointing a finger at a young man named Ed Humphreys, as I mentioned before. So who was Ed Humphrey and why on earth would he, would people point to him as being the Gainesville River? Well, he was born October 5th, 1971 to Elna and George Humphrey in Boston, Massachusetts. His father went to Harvard Business School. Reportedly, there was pretty severe marital issues between his parents. His father wanted a divorce, but his mother did not. His father drank and was abusive to his mother. Ed had a lot of trouble sleeping. He wet the bed up until much later than, than normally happens. He had nightmares and he was a sleepwalker. He was a very intelligent guy. Well, is a very intelligent guy because he's still alive. He, um, he went to Melbourne High School, Melbourne, Florida, not Melbourne, Australia, and he was an A student. He had a really close relationship with his maternal grandmother because his father was not around and his mother was an alcoholic. At age 15, Ed contracted mononucleosis and his moods changed abruptly after that. I'm not so sure that these are connected. I tried doing some research to see if there had been studies um, that connected mood disorders to having had infectious mononucleosis. The most I could find, there was a study from 1980 that made some connection or correlation there, but I was not able to find a whole lot of really good information that says, yes, this is something that's documented and can be directly linked to having had mono. If you read any of the descriptions of Ed's behavior at this time, it sounds like he was incredibly manic and he was actually, he actually did get diagnosed with manic depression, um, which now it's called bipolar disorder, but it used to be in, back in the, back in the nineties, it was referred to as manic depression. He was committed to a hospital and treated at one point. As he continued through high school after this hospitalization, he went to go live with his older brother, George, who was about to begin law school at University of Florida. But while Ed was living with his brother, his, be his behavior got out of control again, and he was eventually hospitalized. He moved back to Melbourne with his grandmother and his mother, and he went back to high school. Ed would not take his medication regularly, and as a result, well, I don't know if it's a direct result, but... He became very argumentative, and he was also very interested in, in violence, in the military, in knives. Once he was back in Melbourne with his grandmother and mother, he had another episode, and he was hospitalized and then stabilized again. Eventually, Ed finished high school, and he went back to Gainesville. 
He finished a summer session just like Sonia and, um, and Christina had. And after that summer session finished, he went back to Melbourne, but his behavior became irrational again. Ed went back to school for the fall and he moved into the Gatorwood apartments. He was only there for a short time, but quickly um, he gained a reputation for his, his behavior and eventually he was kicked out. On August 16th, 1990, Ed and his grandmother were looking for apartments. They found a place at Hawaiian Village and one morning he began to wander and he talked with security officers about wanting to go to Iraq and kill people. So when people were questioned about Ed's behavior around this time of the murders, the, the people or the, the manager from the apartment complex had reported that there was some bizarre stuff going on and what he had talked about. Then on August 24th, 1990, Ed had his worst episode yet. At 1.30 in the morning, he went into a Roy Rogers and became irate when he was told that they were out of gravy when he ordered biscuits and gravy. He told the two women working that he'd been awake for five days. By 4.15 p.m., Ed was at Gatorwood Apartments trying to get his bike unchanged. Uh, apparently, he had lost the key to the lock. So this placed Ed at the Gatorwood Apartments um, on, the, on August 24th between 4 and 4.30 p.m. At 9 p.m., Ed was seen at the Central City Lounge and was refused entry because he was underage. And when he was refused entry, he began to threaten everyone. Shortly after this, he confronted a group of five men and threatened to kill them, telling them he was doing recon. So it sounded like he was having a really severe episode. Later on that same night, after 9 p.m., Ed ran into a girl he knew from school at the Krispy Kreme, and she sat with him for a while. When she got up to believe, he began to refer to himself as John and told her how crazy he was. So all that behavior was happening up until from, you know, August 16th through the 24th and up through the 27th. And by, was it Monday? Monday, August 27th, Ed showed up at the Hawaiian Village apartment at 6 a.m. and he scared the manager there. He walked into the laundry room where she was doing some laundry before, you know, the day got started. And, I mean, he really startled her. She, she asked him if he was okay, and he nodded. So he walked off. He wandered off. He called his grandmother later, and he screamed at her about how he could not find his car. On that same phone call, Ed told his grandmother that there was some guy in Gainesville that was killing people. Ed's grandmother was concerned about the car, so she called campus police about Ed's car and asked them if they would go check on Ed for her. So at about 2 p.m. on August 27th, a couple of officers went to check on Ed. They found two legal sized pieces of paper on his front door that were addressed to the Gainesville Sun. While the police were there, Ed began to talk about how he wanted to go to Panama to fight Noriega. So that he was home and the police um, talked to him at that point, but he wanted to fight Manuel Noriega, who was a um, uh, some kind of socialist or communist dictator um, in Panama back in the 90s. When police asked him if he was okay, he then began talking about the Persian Gulf, and he started to talk about the guy who was cutting up and torturing people. None of the details of the crimes had been released at that point. So that really was kind of a red flag about him um, to the police. On August 30th, 1990, Ed was home at Melbourne with his mother and his grandmother when he got into a violent argument with his 79-year-old grandmother and he hit her. His mother called the police and the police talked Ed's grandmother into filing charges, even though she didn't want to. Once he was in custody, it became clear to him when Gainesville agents showed up that he was being considered a suspect in the Gainesville murders. Ed was interrogated without a lawyer for more than 24 hours. If he was in the midst of a manic episode, I, I mean, it's just terrible. During questioning, he was hyper and he was easily suggestible. His older brother, George, visited Ed and asked Ed if, um, if he had done it, to which Ed began to cry and asked George how he could ask him that. Police released Ed Humphrey's name as the prime suspect. And this went on to ruin. I mean, Ed was already a very fragile person to begin with. And this really uh, pushed him over the edge for a while. So the task force had trouble showing probable cause, though, to have a search warrant issued on him. And, and they found nothing. They found nothing that would indicate 
that Ed Humphrey was the one who was going around killing people. In the midst of all of this chaos, there was a man um, named Stephen Michael Bates who had been bragging about the Gainesville murders to other inmates. I guess he was in jail to other inmates, and he implicated Ed Humphrey by name. But the police had already put Ed Humphrey's name out as a prime suspect. On October 10th, 1990, Ed was convicted of assault on his grandmother, and he was sentenced to 22 months at Chattahoochee State Hospital. So Chattahoochee State Hospital is in the panhandle of the state, and it's a um, it's like this like one of Florida's big mental hospitals. Eventually, Ed's name was cleared because he had nothing to do with it. He was just a sick, mentally, he was a mentally ill individual who was not being treated properly or was not taking his medication properly. And because of his bizarre behavior happened to be, happened to be going on at the same time that these Gainesville murders were, people jumped to conclusion. But eventually his name was cleared. And then in 2000, he graduated from the University of Central Florida with a bachelor's in business administration with a 3.76 GPA. So it sounds like Ed went on to do not so bad for himself, which is great. On the final episode of this series, Danny Rowling, the killer cowboy crooner. Next time, we'll dive into the investigation into the Gainesville Ripper murders in more detail. We'll talk about how Danny Rowling was finally caught. We'll discuss his time in prison, his eventual execution, and we will also talk about all of the things that went wrong in Danny Rawlings' life. Sort of a recap of his life of, of horror. Stay tuned after the closing if you are interested in listening to the rest of what Danny Rawling had to say on the recordings by the campfire. Join me next time as I continue to, t- to dissect the life and crimes of Danny Rawling, the Gainesville Roper. You can follow the podcast on most of your social media platforms at SKB Pod or visit the website at www.skbpod.com for more information about the show. If you're enjoying SKB, please take a moment to give it a five-star review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spreaker, Podcast, whatever your podcatcher of choice is. All I know is I'm just one man alone in this world, facing the whole world by himself. And I'm sending this to the three people I love the most. I always love you. I love my mother. I love my father. And I love my brother. And no matter what anybody thinks of that man, they ain't here all over. I want these three people that I'm talking to right now to know that this is not the road that I I really wanted. This is not what I wanted. But it is the road that is before me now. And I will walk it like a boy. And I'm so sorry, Dad. It rips my heart out by the roots to think what happened between you and I. I'm sorry, Pop. If it means anything, I'm so very sorry. And I suffer a lot behind this. I hurt, hurt in my heart. And it never goes away, Pop. I wish it was me instead of you. I wish it had happened to me instead of you. It's just me and you. Nothing's ever been easy for me. Well, I always wanted to make you proud of me, Dad, but somehow or another, I always fell short. Well, I promise you this much. No matter what happens in the road ahead of me, at least I'll walk it as a man. I will do that. Mom, you are such a precious soul. There ain't a woman on the face of this earth that can cook like you can, sugar. You hear me? You got to be the best cook in the whole wide world. Believe me, I miss it. I love you, Mom. I want you to know your boy's okay. I'm going to be all right. There's something I want you to know. And I, I want you to understand this. 
The last time I saw you, I saw how much it hurt you to say goodbye to me. And you don't want you to purpose it in your mind, and in your heart, and in your soul. So I'm a man now. And God only knows, even God himself said that being a man wasn't easy. And oh, how well I know. It isn't easy.
when you wear your heart on your sleeve. It's easy for people to reach up there and grab it, squeeze it. Kevin's done a lot of good. Don't let what happened between Dad and me. I know it's got the family tore up. But hey, Mom and Dad need you right now. They need you now more than they ever have. And between the two of us, you were the strongest. I love you, Kevin. I love you, brother, more than, than, than even words can even justify. I wish it could have been different. I wanted so much for you and I to strike out together and make a dent in this world and make something out of our lives. It doesn't always happen that way, does it? No, I guess it doesn't. But I love you, brother. I, I want you to go home. I want you to have a good life. My life as it is is not easy. But I will walk it until the Lord decides to take me home. I'll walk the road that is before me the best I can. And I've prayed and I've asked God. I've asked him, I've said, Dear Lord God of heaven and earth, I would rather be judged of you than judged of men because I know the judgments of men and how it stinks. Man does not judge rightly. And that system is a system of devil. Civilization is not the Lord. It's of the devil, brother. So I'll ask God that if I am to be judged, not to be judged of men, but let me fall into the hands of my maker, whom I still love and believe in. I'll always believe in my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, Kevin. Try to bring the family together, what's left of it. And I don't know why people nowadays are so hard on church. I know there's people there that are hypocrites. Blue sky that justifies not going to church and worshiping him. Surely, if you give tithes and it goes into a man's pocket, that's not your fault. And the judgment does not lie upon you, but upon the man that took the money for a wrongful purpose. Seek you in the church, brother. And take mom and dad. We've got to humble ourselves and come before God as he said. Humble and meek like a child. And does a child think how how the father should 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 be? A little child loves his maker loves the Father, and looks to Him for everything. And no matter what, He loves Him. <laughs> Try to get Mom and Dad to go to church with you. They need your prayers. You don't know how difficult it is. Uh, I haven't done without. No, I haven't done without. I'm, do I'm well. I'm well fed, I'm well clothed, and I have a place to stay. Please look after mom and dad. And look after you. And maybe, maybe your prayers. Maybe you can touch the throne of God and his mercy and wisdom. Fill it down there. I don't know. I don't know. I regret it all, but I can't change it. And I'm not going to deliver myself into the hands of men to be tormented by them, by men that are even lesser than myself. No, I'll go to my grave first. I love you, brother. Take care. Every song that I ever wrote to my family, to the three people that I love the most in this world, and the ones that probably I hurt the most. You better get this, get this all together.